Cask Ale is the lifeblood of the British beer industry and a vital part of our country's culture. It was only a few decades ago that it was all we drank in our pubs, but in the last decade or so, it's been in serious, sometimes double-digit decline. The closure of our beautiful pubs and increasingly tight margins in beer all play their part, but there's also been a drop-off in interest in cask ale, especially among younger generations. Its reputation has been damaged by cliches about who drinks it and quality issues related to how hard it is to brew well and serve right. But after eight years of exploring the brewing world, we've come to believe that cask ale at its best is the ultimate way to enjoy beer. We've fallen in love with our traditional pubs, styles, breweries and culture and hate to see it slowly falling apart. So we've decided to do something about it. In a bid to ensure its survival, we've teamed up with Fuller's Brewery and spent the last six months filming stories that we hope will inspire people to get out there and drink cask ale more often. In episode three, we're talking about the future of cask ale. We visit two breweries that have played a huge part in its modernization and continue to push it forward. At the end of the video, we'll get the story behind Darkstar's new Galaxy Hot New England IPA and show how this kind of modern beer can still work on cask. Before that though, we visit Abbeydale, one of the most innovative and diverse cask ale breweries in the country, which also means visiting one of the great brewing cities in England. There's so much from Sheffield, mate. We're talking the home of British steel, we're talking the home of football in the world. Your favourite thing? And this is definitely one of the homes of cask real ale. Absolutely, this town has a rich history of incredible brewing, but we're not here to talk about the history in this episode. This time we're going to be talking about its future. And we are in fact drinking a pint of the future in this, these beautiful Abbeydale pints that we have in front of us. So I'm drinking some Moonshine, which is uh, the majority of Abbeydale's production. Mm. Um, but also, you know, it's an American hop session cask ale, which I think is where a lot of cask ale brewing is going. And you're drinking some New Zealand hopped beer. Mate, I think we're going to blow all the misconceptions away. Real ale is not stuffy. It can be literally anything, right? Exactly. And Abbeydale was founded out of that very belief that, you know, when, a lot of people, when they think of cask ale, they think of a brown bitter. And that's great. We love brown bitters. But there's so much more that you can do with it. And at Abbeydale, we're going to be hearing all about their funk dungeon, about their New England IPAs and hoppy pails, about their saisons, all of which might see the inside of a cask and indeed a sparkler on oh. the bar. So without further ado, let's head over to the amazing Abbeydale, which this year celebrates its 25th anniversary. So I'm here with Laura from Abbey Dale, who's going to give us a tour. Um, it feels quite ramshackle and built upon, as most yeah. breweries do. Yeah, definitely. So we're, we occupy uh, four different units uh, in this area now. Uh, this was the second one um, that we added in in uh, around 2008. Uh, so that's when the uh, when this uh, brew kit came in. Yep. Um, it's all fermenting vessels uh, all down on this side. So sort of flat bottom so ones that are doing real ales or? Yep, yeah, yeah. Uh, the majority of what we produce is still cask beer. Um, so yeah, the majority of our tanks are currently this kind of style. Yep. Um, although as you see, we're moving over to uh, a few uh, DPVs as well. So this is uh, one of my favorite parts of the brewery. Uh, this is currently used as our hot back, uh, but with the second mash tun that we have. Um, unfortunately, the original one is, uh, is long gone, but right. it's really nice that we're still able to make use of, of this, this one's one. holding on strong yeah so this is this is where it has hop stands and stuff like that with the yeah the so, bigger stuff uh, that you do yeah so we do use this for every single beer uh, that right. we make um obviously hoppy pale ales are uh, sort of our forte really um but yeah every single beer uh, will will go through here and have mm. hops added at, at yeah, this it has stage. to come through that little bit of history before it can absolutely go do its thing in the fermenter yeah yeah Definitely. These big tanks that we're walking past are what our double brews go in. So uh, these are 60 barrels. Uh, these four big ones tend to be used um, almost exclusively for moonshine. Uh, 
right. which forms approximately 50% of our output. Um, and then obviously every single cask gets filled in here too. So you've got you've so, got all that fermenting space out there, and then a, a two-line and a lot of hammering to do. Yeah. So uh, this runs pretty much all day every day. After a whistle-stop tour, we pulled a sweaty gym out of the hotback to tell us what it's like to work in a brewery that makes a huge amount of cask but still tries to push the boundaries. Jim, thank you for taking some time out of your busy schedule. Yeah, thank Which, you. I don't think I've ever seen such a busy brew house. You had dry hopping, digging out uh, a hotback and mashing out. I think, yeah, you just came at a very fortunate time in, in, when, in brew day. <laughs> brew day land, yeah. But so, it seems like it's always like this. You're brewing seven or eight times a week, you said. Yeah, so double brewing like three times a week and then the rest of the days are just single brew days. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, volume production of... Uh, of Beer and I think that's it's got a good turnover of um, work through the system and it kind of keeps the consistency up and regularity and I think that that kind of helps a lot with our beers yeah 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 it must be reassuring the throughput's so good that you're constantly yeah brewing fresh and everything's going in the cold storage straight back out and yeah that's it that's the aim and really that's what you want with cast beer we're now at a point where we're quite flexible in the styles of beer that we can sell in in the past we might have struggled to sell um, regularly sell 8%, 9% pale beers. We would always brew a barley wine like once a year, but it's still, that's, that would still sit in cask mainly <laughs> as well, which again, when you're selling a 10% beer in cask is quite difficult. But yeah. The, but yeah, we're now kind of quite flexible. We all have our own specific tastes as well, right. um, generally, or we'll preferences of what we'll go for, and um, that generally means we'll, between the brew team, we'll have a plethora of ideas that that we want to make, of beers and styles that we want to make. And, and a lot of that is going to going to cask, even, even some of your sour stuff. Yeah, so we kind of, um, we will do a couple of casks and there's often do like, um, like a single hopped Brett Saison, a lower ABV thing that we'll just brew a few hundred litres of. And yeah, that, that quite nicely just kind of sits Saison, Brett Saison Grisette kind of area, but quite yeah. hoppy just really good and quite works really well on cask but it's just in a slightly different yeah, like style with brett it's dry and then the hoppiness will you know be restrained within that cask format it could be a really sessionable beer it sounds delicious to yeah. me yeah so so that's the kind of aim is to keep on doing them into 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 cask as we go forward mm -hmm. um but still quite a kind of heritage and traditional way of of having and drinking pale ales is they're, mm. they're going to have a little bit of traditionally they will have had some ingress of other wild yeasts. Yes, yeah, historically they would have had some kind of mixed fermentation yeah. element. So it makes sense that it, yeah. it still works. Yeah. yeah. And so so trying to, to kind of aim at, like keep that tradition of English beer flavour, British beer flavour, um, in the beers that we're making at the moment. At the end of the day, cask is is a format, right? So if you design for that format, you know, anything can kind of work. Yeah. On there, it doesn't have to be this cliche of cask for this, keg for that, can yeah. for that, bottle for that. Yeah, it's not one style of beer per unit of serve. Yeah, I mean, ca cask ale still has some people. When you say cask ale, will picture a certain beer. Yeah, and it really doesn't need to be that way. Yeah, it doesn't need to just be brown. Yeah, it can be a, a slightly different colour of brown. <laughs> <laughs> Things got busy in the brew house again, so we stepped into the barrel room to meet the owners of Abbeydale, Pat and Sue, who told us about the origins of the brewery and where this passion for American and wild brewing comes from. So, I mean, the thing I have to ask you is, you know, you've been in business for 25 years, been a cask-led brewery for 25 years. What was it like, what was the cask scene like when you opened and, and what's the change been through to, to 2021? Well, the market's changed significantly, of course. Uh, back in 95, it was really quite difficult to find uh, customers at all. Right, literally just customers, not even yeah. customers interested in, in what you were doing. Just customers who were able to uh, who were able to purchase from us. Right, so those, the, the beer those, tie was... Those clubs were tied. Yeah, yeah. And so what, what got you into the beer business when, did you know that going in, that it was going to be tough? I'd already been in the beer business for five years then. Right. It was prior to that I was at uh, Kellam Island Brewery. Okay. So I was started there in uh, 91. Mm -hmm. So 
I, I just took a job as a brewer there. With, with any prior experience of that, or that was... Not whatsoever. <laughs> no. But drinking experience, I presume. And home brewing experience. And, oh, right, OK, of course, right. So, I mean, Kellam Island were, were very early on sort of the American hop kind of um, theme, which is that where it came from with Abbeydale as well, taking that inspiration? Yes. Uh, when I went to Kellam Island, we were only making two, uh, two beers there, mm -hmm. and they were both you know, traditional brown uh, bitter beers. Right. And uh, I produced a beer called uh, Pale Rider. Yeah. And that was based entirely on uh, Willamette hops. Right. That would have been back in about 1992, 1993. Mm -hmm. And that, that beer went on to win... It did, yes. Great British Beer yes. Festival yeah. gold, didn't it? It was yeah. much extraordinary at the time. It isn't anymore. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm denigrating Pale Rider. I mean, it was... Um, that amount of hop character in a beer was yeah. unusual at the yeah. time. It yeah. was very usual. So when, when you came to set up your, your own place, did you want to take that, that you know, very hot forward approach to sort of cask bitter so. over here? Yes, yes. So did you start with quite a wide range? You realised that that was going to be needed or, or was it something that sort of come in the last couple of years? As we stayed away from a lot of the stuff that most people were doing at the time, from big brewers down to micros, which is basically uh, uh, brown bitter beers heavily influenced by crystal malt. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to stay away from that. We'd always done a lot of um, specials in cask. Um, I mean, we've typically put out one new beer per week, um, wow. almost, certainly since the early 2000s. Mm. So th there's, a, there's a real narrative that, you know, cask is, has been struggling and it has sort of overall been in, in decline. But do you, do you see a bright future for, you know, independent and more experimental cask going forward? I do. Yeah, I think so. I think there's a real um, market out there for interesting cask, and I think some of the places that currently are doing a lot of keg will start to experiment with interesting cask. Right, you think that it yeah. could have a, a revival on the way of, yeah, I think so. of interest in the former? Yeah, I mean, some of the stuff we're putting into, into barrel here, uh, the stuff we've got behind us, like the pineapple weed saison that we made, then uh, it'd be really interesting to try that in cask. Mm -hmm. It's really built as a reputation in a whole different different area, mm. and that's great. And that's something that we want to expand on. So, you know, making more and more investment into, uh, into wood. So that was an eye-opening morning, wasn't it? Crikey. Mate, what a beautiful space. The organic sort of nature that Abbeydale has grown in, it just really feels like it's been there forever. It's yeah, you, you can almost trace the way that Carscale has gone in those 25 years yeah. in each edition that they've had to add to that as they grew. It was, it was absolutely amazing. And we're going to reward ourselves with plenty more uh, American hopped session Carscales. Beautiful. But don't get too comfortable, Bradley. Go on. Because we are, <laughs> we are about to head down uh, to Sussex. Uh, to a special brewery where we will be witnessing the brew and indeed the launch of an incredibly unsessionable beer on cast just to prove how wild, how exciting cask ale can be if you believe in it. Mate, I can't wait. And so we jumped on a train due south and headed to Darkstar. The brewery is most famous for its session American hop beer, Hophead, which changed many people's perceptions of beer in the late 90s and early 2000s. But it's recently received a new lease of life under head brewer Henry, who's been charged with starting another phase of innovation. That's taken many forms, but on the day that we visited, he was launching his first New England IPA in cask, Galaxy Haze, a beer so hoppy, even he was unsure if it would work. So Henry, it's delightful to be here. I mean, Dark Star's been through huge changes. It's quite, it's certainly in craft terms, it's quite a historic brewery, mm. but it feels like right now, Dark Star's going through a reinvention and really modernizing in the styles it's brewing. Um, it's, it certainly is. Um, we've been given carte blanche to sort of um, create modern, exciting cast beer. So yeah, we've done lots of different beers uh, in, the, in the past year. So we did Trail Ridge, which is a cast beer which had Citra and Centennial in it. Then we did a Nordland beer, which is um, with Quebec yeast. Does, Johnny, so how do you pronounce it? No one knows. No, no one, one knows. knows. Quike? Quike? I don't know. But the Norwegian farmhouse yeast that ferments incredibly fast, it, incredibly hot. Exactly. It was fruity. amazing. Fermenting at 40 degrees was, was thrilling. Um, <laughs> and that had lots of galaxy in it. Um, and then finally, we've got Sunquake. Um, that's got um, Azaka, Mosaic, and Chinook in it, and big, big dry hop. 
There's often a lot of talk in the in the in the beer world about how American style brewing doesn't necessarily really translate to cask, perhaps because you haven't got the effervescence to get mm. the aroma and stuff like that. Do you do you agree with that? It's certainly the number one thing. Um, cask beer, we talk in volumes of CO2 here, so it's like 1.8, whereas a lot of these kegs are like 2.8 maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that does that level of CO2 does help lift it, but I think such is the sort of saturation of these new hops and the new flavours that it can work yeah. at a sort of lower level and it does do something different. I guess kind of on the flip side as well, so with, the, with New England Brewing you're always looking for a really slick, full mm. mouthfeel and cask has that in spades, so from a texture point of view it's a great format. That is an excellent point, yeah absolutely, delivering that sort of soft pillowy flavour um, is what cask can really do absolutely do you, do you think that these kind of styles this kind of brewing is is something that's really gonna help cars sort of drive forward and, and be seen as you know a format you know it's not a style we can put whatever we want through cars can find the benefits is is it important to show that with these styles i really really hope so you know i think best bitter god bless them i love them you know they're still holding on there as the number one cast product and we need to push that forward because we need to harness all that excitement that you've got in craft and bring it into cast because cast is such an important thing. We can't, we can't lose it and we can't just keep it as a traditional pigeonhole, uh, if you will. Um, so yeah, I think it's vital that we all start making these beers. And, and you're hoping that the people that, that maybe try this on cast who haven't really drunk cast, they've mm. seen cask as being a little bit fusty maybe, they'll try this, they'll love this, and then they'll, maybe they'll start to recognize the joy of a great cask bitter, or a great cask mild, or a great cask porter. That, that is the dream. If this can be the gateway beer into mild, the mild comeback, um, that, would be, that would be a thrill. There's going to be nothing mild about the New England IPA Henry's launching though. Galaxy Haze is the hoppiest beer he's ever brewed, and at a heady 6.5%, it breaks another rule of classic cask brewing. This is going to be a huge beer, and one that's going to turn heads, whether for the right reasons or the wrong ones. Is it going to offer something different, or is it going to offer something, you know, just depending on where your loyalty's like? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good question. I'm excited about trying it, because um, trying it in tank, you get this amazing aroma, uh, but without that carbonation, it's, it's a bit heavy. You know, it's a bit, um, you know, you're getting that silt. Um, so I'm hoping that the week it's had in cask, the magic of cask conditioning has really helped to sort of marry it all together, I think. So I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I mean, it, we're on the edge here. So we're in the beautiful evening star. Um, and we have half a pint of just about the haziest beer I've ever seen. So, <laughs> sight test, nailed it. Are you sure it's not an orange juice here? You're not trying to trick us, are you? Yeah, I just slipped in a bit of vodka while you weren't looking. <laughs> it's, a, it's a screwdriver. Yeah. Um, so lots of people elsewhere in the pub are drinking it as well. That's a good sign. It is. Should, should we get the aroma and, and yeah. see what we think of it? Wow, yeah. Ooh. Apricot, orange mm. peel, that's what I'm getting. Yeah, yeah, very, really, very, really nice. very pithy. Yeah, exactly, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah, I'm happy really, with that. really juicy coming off of coming off. juice. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's give it a go, cheers. Cheers, cheers, cheers. lovely to see you boys. Oh. There you go. So the first thing's first, is that it's got a nice level of carbonation there. I think that was my biggest worry coming into this whole thing. That, so this beer was wrapped a week ago, so it's had a week in cask to add that beautiful magical secondary fermentation thing. Um, and I think that, that sort of really helps, isn't it? That, that lifts it in a way that I was, I was praying to the yeast gods about. <laughs> but it's a nice fine carbonation as mm. well, which really helps. It's super velvety, isn't it? Mm. Like, I think the sheer volume of hops, because hops can affect mouthfeel, mm. it feels oily and slick, and then it also feels pillowy and soft uh, from, from all the adjuncts. It's just unctuous, unbelievable. <laughs> you know, that's cask. Mm. So many people would just say that that's not a cask beer. Yeah. I think that, that is that the future of cask? Is it doing stuff like this that's a bit different? 
Yeah, I don't see why not. I don't see why not. I'm really, uh, the emotions that are washing over me is just relief. Um, <laughs> you know, I think it's, I think it, the color is great. I think the aroma is great. Why not? So we needed a second opinion, and I'm delighted to say that I'm now joined by uh, award-winning and local beer writer, Emma Inch. Hello, um, thanks th for inviting me. Not at all, thanks for coming. So let's dive into the beer first, and then I'll ask you about your opinions on the future of cars, because okay. maybe it'll change as a result uh... of this beer. Who knows, <laughs> I may be building that up too much. So yeah, get, get the aroma and the taste, and let me know what you think. The thing that, that leaps out is the, um, is the kind of texture and the consistency, which, which because, of, because of what I know it to be, mm -hmm. and because it's, it looks like this, I just thought I wasn't expecting that kind of smoothness of Cascale. And, and it really works. It absolutely works. Um, and I'd, I've not had anything like that, I don't think, that, that has that such the, the aroma profile and taste profile of, of New England, but the, the, the richness and depth that a cask can give it. Yeah, I mean, on, on keg and in can, you know, New England style brewers are always trying to encapsulate what is almost a cask feel, which is richness of body, smooth, velvety carbonation, rich, pillowy kind of like love heart explosion on your tongue. And you just get that. I'm not even sure what water treatment they've done. I don't think there's any. But the cask mm. format just has it there already. Yeah, when the when um, the guy came and put them down, we could smell it, couldn't we? We could smell it on yeah, the table. Yeah, wafted straight out. Um, yeah, and that's I mean that's a lovely thing about beers, isn't it? So I mean it, it, it's obviously a huge success, like from from a flavour standpoint. But do you think that this could be a way that we could bring cask to the the, the modern drinker? Is, is, has that been the issue, the styles that we've been putting in it, or has it been another issue you know if i talk to to uh to friends of mine who are beer lovers who go to the pub who you know who love the pub um you know and they'll, they'll say oh i had this really good beer last night and uh you know i think you really like it it was called such and such and i'll say oh is, it, is that a cask beer or, or a keg beer and they'll be like, what I don't, yeah I don't do, know. and you're like and you're like was it like manually yeah, pulled, you have to do the thing <laughs> yeah. yeah or did they go and uh and you sort of think well if people who enjoy beer and would call themselves a beer lover aren't getting what that's about, mm -hmm. uh, then, then we're doing something wrong kind of thing. Yeah. And I think sometimes yeah. it's the language we use. So when you then, if they then say, well, what do you mean, what a cask? And you then sort of talk about live or, or secondary fermentation. Like, well, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. you know, I, don't, I don't want that. Is that going to give me gas? Is that, is that, I don't know. I don't want that. Um, and maybe we should be talking about it in a, in a different way and, you know, in, a, in a, uh, a way more like we talk about other artisanal products. Um, and you know, sourdough bread, for example, I'm not the first person to compare that by any means, but, but people have kind of got their heads around that, or lots of people have now, and maybe, maybe it's Cask's time to, to be yeah, the sourdough. Yeah, I guess something I hadn't really thought about is the idea that lots of people now are coming into pubs and going, what IPAs do you have? And uh, you know, at almost no point has, or particularly New England IPAs do you have, at almost no point has the barman or bar, whoever's behind the bar, at no point have they able to go uh, we've got this cask beer. Mm -hmm. It's always been, well, we've got this, this and this, and it happens to be on keg. So, you know, for somebody to go in and ask for a New England IPA, the fact that they could reach for a cask ale mm. is quite an exciting prospect. Mm. And if people aren't it making is. that distinction, you know, that's unfortunate, but it's also an opportunity, it right? Is. It is. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. You're right. This could, this could drag some people unexpectedly <laughs> to the dark side yeah. of cask. I love an unexpected drag. I yeah. think that's, that's the way that education <laughs> should work. If we've learned one thing during this week's adventure, and indeed throughout the series so far, is that cask is just a format, a wonderful way to present beer at its freshest and most alive. That means the cliches about who drinks it and what styles you can serve through it needlessly hold it back. Modern Brewing started in cask with the likes of Kellam Island and Darkstar, and while they've been joined by fantastic brewers like Abbeydale, there's still so many opportunities being missed by brewers and by drinkers. The answer to that issue, of course, is the place that it served. Next week, we're exploring a new revolution happening in the UK's on trade, one that's breathing new life into the world of cask. So we'll see you in the micropubs of Thanet. <laughs>